In today's video, we are going to be making us a leather case for this axe right here. Now this is the same axe that you saw in our how to properly restore an axe video. And in that video, you saw that we did invest a little bit of energy into turning this into a proper functioning tool. So naturally we want to keep it that way. And if you don't have a case to protect this edge, your ax can quickly be reduced down to no more than just a garden tool filled with nicks and dings and absolutely capable of no performance at all. So we don't want that to happen. So let's go ahead and get some leather on the table and some tools and start some layout. So before we get too far along, I think it might be important to take a minute to talk about the two basic different kinds of leathers. You have a soft leather and you have a hard leather. And I think this will better enable you to make a more educated decision when you're sourcing materials for whatever project you may have in the future. So soft leather is something I think, I think mo more people are more familiar with soft leather. It's used in purses and bags and uh, couch cushions and all kinds of stuff. I, I made my apron out of it and, and, and soft leather, it can get wet and it'll dry soft. And so for those applications, it's good. We're not going to use soft leather today. We're going to be using veg tan. Now this is a little bit less common. A lot of you guys will know uh, all about veg tan, but some of you guys won't. And so veg tan is, uh, it's vegetable tan, veg tan. If you Google it, it's veg tan leather. That's what you want to Google if you're trying to source it. Okay, so the veg tan has some unique properties. One, it's amazingly strong, super rigid, but when you get it wet, it becomes really flexible and it's easy to manipulate over a compound shape. And then when it dries, it, uh, it has a desire to stay the shape that you have created. And in other words, continue to perform the task that you have employed it to do. And I have some examples. Right here is a knife case. And, and it's a fairly compound shape, and, and it gets wet, and you can set that super tight fit. You can even hear it lock in. So it can never fall out. And uh, you can see that nice compound shape. We got it wet and shaped it around there, and, uh, and you can just see how rigid that stays. So what a neat material. So the, the veg tan is, is, a, is a really neat material, and that's what we're going to be using today. So I hope that made some sense. Uh, let's go ahead and start making a pattern and cutting into that roll of veg tan right there and get busy. So this is a case that we are going to be making one very close to this one. And I thought you guys might need to kind of see like what a finished product looks like. So as we're going through the steps, you can follow along and better understand what it is we're actually doing. So this is a, a case that doesn't have a buckle. And it goes on just like that. You'll see a lot of cases you have to stick the axe all the way through like this, put it on, and then you snap it over. And that's incredibly awkward and incredibly silly. And it takes all kinds of material and a bunch of different components and hardware. Completely unrealistic. And uh, so when you're taking your case on and off your axe a lot, these, I think, work a lot better and also are way faster to make. So let's start laying out a pattern for this sucker right here. So again, I'm going to go back to our card stock. I, I, I salvage like any sort of card stock when I'm opening boxes or anything. And I'm going to lay out a quick and dirty pattern. And this pattern is not going to be accurate at all. This is just going to be quick. So whenever we cut out uh, the rough blank of leather from our, our roll of edge tan, we don't waste too much of it. I'm going to give us some room back here. I'm going to give us some room up top. And I'm going to give us some room right here. And uh, that is going to be our rough pattern. When I am cutting out my, my roll of leather, I always try to maintain that long piece up there because you need that for all kinds of different things like making belts and stuff. So you don't just want to start randomly placing your pattern anywhere and destroying that nice long edge. I'm going to reserve that for long options. And another thing is when you're marking on leather, you don't want to, you don't use a pencil. You use your scratch-all. 
and and you just it just presses into it and makes a really nice mark and you can see I'm, I'm not following my pattern exactly because this pattern is not that accurate and also this is only a case for an axe and so I got down here where there's a little bit of compound wrinkles and that's going to haunt us but it's going to be okay because it's just an axe case So we have a rough cutout of our pattern right here. Now it's still got a lot of extra material. We got to start reducing it down, but we really need to get it to fit tight around the compound shape of that axe. And so how to do that is to get it wet. And this is, there's only water in this spray bottle. And so you just spray it down and you can literally just watch it soak in. And uh, you don't have to go soak it in the sink for an hour or anything. You just watch it soak right in. And there we go. Now we're ready to work. It's, it's way softer than it was. So we got to start getting it to fit a lot more accurately and getting it to try to compound to shape to this axe. It has a lot of rocker in it right here. All right, so this is this is no more than just a smooth piece of wood. And you can see I'm kind of just getting a rough shape there. And once we get the rough shape, then we kind of lay it down, keeping its position. And then we fold it back open. And this is actually going to be a fairly accurate mark right here. So you want this to happen with good flow. And we're going to stay way away from the cutting edge because we have to leave enough room to put a welt in there. This will make more sense here in a minute. But you have to put a welt in there. You have to leave plenty of room for it. So it's important for this line to have pretty accurate flow. And these need to be fairly accurate here as well. This needs to be a a fairly reasonably good flow here. There's still a lot of room for correction, but you still kind of want to do a good job. And you see I'm staying away from that line because I want to trim that one later. And now once you get that side cut out, you have to fold it back over and match it to the other side. And I'm doing a, a kind of a rough mark right here because we're going to trim that later, but the front needs to be a little more accurate. So we have a rough shape coming out here. Now it's time to work on this welt right here. So I got this scrap piece of veg tan right here. And uh, here's a pair of dividers. Incredibly useful. I'm just going to guess how long or how wide I need that welt. And uh, I've just done so many times that it, I can just tell how wide it needs to be. And it's not really specific. This is somewhere around like 5 eighths or something, half inch to 5 eighths. That welt is going to go right in like that and it's going to protect the threads from that cutting edge. So we have our rough out right here and we have our welt. Now it's time to start laying out the stitches. Again, we go back to our divider and we decide on how far back from the front 
So we want that in about right there because we're going to leave a little bit of room. We don't want it right up on the edge because we're still going to trim these both together after they have been sewn. And you can see that leaves that much of a welt on the inside to protect our cutting edge. So I'm just going to go ahead and lay out that right there. And you can see this right here is okay of a flow, but it's not the best flow in the world. So if I run my dividers along through there, it's, it's going to mirror that, those bumps, and it's going to make my seam look like I don't know how to sew. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to iron some of those out. So when I run those dividers on there, it's going to flow way better. And you can see that's way better of a flow. Now, when that mirrors that, that outer edge, it's going to make our seam look real good. Okay, so that's that. Now we're going to lay out our stitches <coughs> with this too. And that's about how far apart we want them. I'm going to start at the top. And you could go down through there just eyeballing. But it would look like you went down through there eyeballing. And that would not be good. It's better just to take the time to lay it out. On all of our how-to videos, you uh, probably hear us talk about how important it is to do a proper layout. We're going to stop about right there because that gives us some trimming room right there. And again, we're going to go over here and lay out this welt so all our stitches will align properly. And we are going to go with the smallest option on our hole punch here. That's all our holes punched there and halfway down through here. Now we have to align it properly. And this is kind of critical. And we have to transfer this layout to the other side. You have to make sure that with each one of these marks, your leather is staying in the same place and it's not like crab walking with each punch because then at the end you're, you're terribly off and, and it's just, it's bad. So you can see that is a pretty successful transfer of those marks. And now we just have to punch them all. So we've got all our holes punched in our front seam as well as our welt. Now we have to cut this strap out and lay out for the strap because it's easier to sew that strap on before you get this front seam, otherwise it's difficult to get the needle in there. So let's cut that strap out. So we're going to go back to the dividers. And I'm just going to pill for a measurement from here. And this strap, you can cut it however wide you want it. This might be helpful. This looks like 5 8 But you can cut it however wide you feel is necessary. And a, a minute ago, when I cut out that other leather, I said when you cut something out, it's, it's always good to maintain a nice long edge and then you cut something out over here and you can see right here we're about to use that nice long edge. So this is one of the reasons why you want to maintain that edge. So we're going to lay out for the stitches on our strap and I definitely don't recommend freestyling in with stitch layout because nine times out of ten it's going to look like you freestyled in and didn't have any layout but I, I've done it enough to where it, it's it comes out fairly symmetrical but do take your time with that so the placement of this strap is critical if it's too low when you go around through here, blah, 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 how you're actually going to tie it is that last is going to tuck through there. 
and it won't tuck through there unless you leave enough space. You have to leave ample amounts of space to actually allow that to tuck through. So you have to hold that at the right angle and it can't be like this and it can't be like that. It has to be at the right angle to actually be able to wrap and follow around the handle and, uh, and still have this loop that's going to be developed right there to accept the uh, strap as it comes around and that's going to be what actually uh, secures your lashing. So I think right about there looks like the right spot. And again, when you're laying this out, I'm holding it up here so you can see it with the ca camera, but when you do it, make sure to uh, get in a stable position. And when you mark the first hole, make sure it's not moving each time. And uh, otherwise, that can create major problems. Now, when you're sewing, you're supposed to do what's called a saddle stitch. And I'm not doing a saddle stitch now, but that's because this is a very short run and I'm going to do two passes. It'll make sense here in a minute. So you can see what's happening here is it's every other one at this point. But there's seven holes. So that's an, an uneven number. So naturally, as I go around for my second lap, it's going to fill in that odd space. And that's why I don't need to do a saddle stitch right there. You can see it filling in. I just needed to do two laps. What we're sewing with is artificial sinew. It's a waxed nylon. Incredibly strong. So that's it sewn on. We got to tie off the back, and that is one of the many advantages of using waxed nylon. Is when you tie it off, it gives you the option to melt it. The tying is good, but the melting is what really actually holds it. You can see I melt it down pretty flat and then I press it on in and that way the cutting edge isn't going to catch it and that's pressed in really really flat and it's never ever going to uh, back off so the melting is important. So we are going to sew our front seam up there and when you do the front seam you, you do need to do a proper saddle stitch and in order to do that you have to have two needles and so I've got our two needles one on either end of the thread and we're going to stick our welt in here and we are going to start at the top and get that properly aligned and then we're going to center up on our thread here I like to do like, like two go arounds here to start with because it locks the thread better. And then I can kind of just, I can move a little faster and I don't do it all at the same time. I don't do both stitches at the same time. I go up a little bit with one and then I come and I catch up with the other needle. And if I do like a double whammy there, then it locks it and I can pull it tight with each one. Otherwise it just keeps slipping. And this is one reason why it's kind of important to take your time on your layout so all of your holes line up right. So once I get a little bit up through there with the one needle, I move over to the other needle. And then I catch up. And this follows 
or this fills in the, uh, the blank space. So with your two needles, you can see the first needle is every other one, and then the second thread following up fills in that gap. And it's doing the same thing on the other side. And so you can see how that's coming out fairly nice. Okay, so we are finishing up our stitches here. And when I get to the end, I want to make sure that it's reasonably trimmed up here. And the face of this is moderately even because I want to do a few locking stitches here. and go around the outside like that. And so, I don't necessarily think that you need these here, but they do make it a lot stronger. So that's two whips there. And I'm gonna go over here and do two more whips. And I feel like that is a high stress area and this will just lock it and make it a lot tighter. And then we're going to tie it off right here. And so when you tie it off, obviously you can back feed the needles through there and uh, hide your, your tie. And that's all fine and, and good if you don't want to see the tie. But the actual tie-off is, is visually appealing to us because having spent so much time sailing and having to deal with things fraying and unraveling. And so when you can visually see that melted uh, tie-off and you can, you can just, every time you look at it, you can see it's not coming undone. That just gives you a feeling of, of confidence. So I actually prefer the look of those. Okay, so there is our welt running out wild. And you can see our, our leading edge right there, the face of that, all of those come together okay, but they're definitely not perfect. And that's why I wasn't worried about the whole time because once we actually have got it all sewed together, we're gonna trim them all up at once. And I want to bring to your attention, everyone who's watching, you can see how nice this leather is cutting. And it's cutting that nice for a couple of reasons. One is this, this knife that I'm using is really, really sharp. But the other reason is, is it's, it's kind of wet. And wet leather cuts way better than dry leather. So that is that. Now we're going to burnish that up a little bit. Just a quick rough out here. And, and that looks that looks pretty good. So let's get us another fit and start working on this and really flowing this in and refining the whole thing. So I'm just keeping it not wet, but just not dry either. You don't want to get it too wet. Now we're going to really start refining the fit of it. Doing just a little bit of fine tuning. When the leather is wet, now use the term wet loosely, just damp. Once you make the cuts, the cuts are a little bumpy. But when you get your burnishing stick and, and just roll them out, then 
it looks like you did a really good job with the, with the cuts because it really just flows them out proper. So I'm just doing some fine tuning right here. When your leather, I'll say it again, I've said it before, but when your leather is still a little damp, you can get your burnishing stick and you can just keep going over it and ironing out all of the kinks and getting it to really custom fit your ax so it just really locks on tight. And that's what we're trying to accomplish here is the perfect fit. Okay, we have most of our burnishing done right now. And so let's get this strap to fit and trim it down to the right length. All right, we've got a lot of our burnishing done. We've got our strap cut to length. You can see I'm still aggressively tightening it as I put it on because it needs to kind of grow to that position so when you wrap it around through there it just falls into place. And uh, that was basically it. Still a little bit wet and flexible so as it dries we're going to continue to do some more burnishing and some more fitting. As we just notice little bumps and just little impurities, we go around it and keep uh, just keep ironing out the kinks and uh, truing it up and flowing it out, making it look better and better. If you give up too early, then it will look like you gave up too early. But if you keep going around and just working it out until it really just becomes part of the tool. You just got to keep going and going and until it becomes part of the tool and you'll be more pleased with your product that way. So I, I think that's a pretty good fit right there. And I think that's pretty practical. It comes off real quick. You ready to go to work and it goes on pretty quickly. It's ready to go back under the seat of your truck or back on the wall of your shop or in your toolbox or wherever you keep it. And again, it's a little damp still. But we'll just keep going over and working the kinks out. But that's pretty much that. All right, so this is our finished product. You know, it's a little bit soft, a little bit wet. We're going to tune it up as it dries until it just matches and it's it's one with the axe. Uh, so yeah, that's what one looks like. I think that's a fairly practical design. And we have different designs around here with buckles and everything. And the buckles are cool, but not everybody has a buckle. And the buckles are rattly and stuff. And I, and I don't feel like they're any faster. And I don't really feel like they really grip like this one does. And then the silly design with the hole in the bottom where you have to slide the axe through. That one's completely impractical. So this one I think is really, really fast. And if your axe case is too hard to use, you won't use it. <laughs> and uh, you'll just have a really nice axe that has a really nice case on it. And it'll just stay that and you'll never use it because it's too difficult to get off. So it has to come on and off really, really easy in order for it to really be practical. Anyways, so this axe right here in our how to carve or how to restore an axe video, we, 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 we said we paid $35 for that axe head, which was overpaid about 100%. But, but the question is, is was it worth it? And clearly, in, in my opinion, it, it obviously was. But, but let us know what you guys think if this was worth $35. <laughs> let us know in the comments your thoughts on that situation. Anyways, that is about it for this video. So I hope this brought you some value, and I hope you guys enjoyed watching, and we'll see you next time.